Welcome to Seniors on the Move. My name is Karen McKenzie, and we have Patty Tebow with us today, and we're going to talk about hospice. A lot of people don't know about it. Uh, they get a little nervous about it. I think it's a very comforting thing for us, and I want you to know everything possible. So we're going to try to find all of that out today, and we have a real expert, and I'm so happy to have you here. I really am. So I want to read a little bit about Patty Tebow. Uh, she's been with Notre Dame, right? Yes. Um, I've been there, beautiful place, she, uh, working for the at-home division since 2016. Wow. The at-home division provides hospice and palliative care services to folks in the Central Mass area. Wow. Programs include hospice for both pediatric, which I was not aware of, and adults, for adults both, as well as two different palliative care programs, which she will tell us about a little bit later on. She started as a medical coder and intake coordinator. Sounds like a lot of work, Patty. As part of intake, she was able to set up infrastructure to support the growing hospice census. Yes, it is growing for sure. Having had a background in sales and management, the next transition was to become director of marketing and admission. This allowed her to spend more time in the community, strengthening partnerships, creating relationships with other professionals, and educating the community on all services that Notre Dame's at-home division offers. So Patty, where do we want to start? I've got myths and facts here. Tell me yes. what you want to say about that. You know, I always start with the myths and facts because I am a daughter and a sister and a mother, you know, <laughs> and so I myself have experienced different um, health issues of, of you know, the, my family and, and hospice um, and different scenarios leading into those. And so I had a lot of misconceptions about what hospice was. Um, I was unsure, you know, in the decision-making process. Prior to 2016 when I started, I had, was in a different background. It wasn't healthcare. Um, and so, oh. yeah, I actually got into this because of an experience I had with hospice and my dad, who had pancreatic cancer. Mm. After he passed, I was at a crossroads in my career and I went back to school. <laughs> I thought, how you. can I get into this? And I had the marketing and I had the business background and I had management, but I, I felt like, you know, I, I need to learn this, this medical world. I need, and how am I going to do that at this age, you know, and, and what's that going to look like? So I, I, I thought medical coding. Um, and uh, also it was, a, it, was a, it was a program, it was like a whole uh, associates where it was more than medical coding. It also in, included... Um, billing and healthcare, just, just um, learning the, the language, you know, and things yes. like that. So, and I actually went to work at a surgeon's office for, for quite some time just to get the, again, to sure. get the language and the understanding about that world before I went into hospice. You've had um, a lot of experience. So it's, it, but I'll tell you, it was, it was the experiences that I had, like I said, as a daughter, as, as part of a health, you know, a community of, of friends who I heard different experiences about, and I was fortunate enough to know the executive director of Notre Dame Healthcare, who at that time was an RN case manager. Okay. And ultimately was promoted to clinical director and then executive director. But we would have a lot of conversations around these subjects. I found it so interesting. And when my dad was on hospice, I wasn't getting any, you know, they would tell you something, you didn't quite understand it, um, and she would clarify it for me because the myth is hospice is at the end, like the end, end, end. Yes. What is that, the end, end, end? Who's to, who's to say what that is, right? Sure. So we, we, we think, and I say we, the general public think of if I sign my name on that hospice paperwork, I've just decided I'm going to pass. I'm going to die. Or my loved one has to sign on my behalf. The guilt, right? I, if I sign this, I'm admitting this is going to happen. But the truth is, we're not in control of what's going to happen in that sense, right? We don't know how long. We don't know how fast. We don't know. And, and so you're not giving your power away 
you're actually regaining power because now you're bringing people in who are experts and they're going to educate you. So you feel it's a comfort. I more would think. Under, you understand more. So when you see something happening to your loved one or you yourself have something happening, you know the why. Why is this happening? Um, and again, back to the myths and facts, which is very, very important, is at end of life, a lot of times, and I think people will understand it when it's when it's explained, but of course, if you're seeing something and it's not explained, our knee jerk as, especially, if I, I think, and I don't wanna be sexist, but women, mothers, you know, when your kids are sick, you try to feed them. You wanna make sure they don't get dehydrated. As a caregiver to your wife or your husband or your sister, that's how you get them better, right? You make mm -hmm. sure. Now at end of life, things are starting to shut down. Yes. Right, the body is preparing, yes. the brain is preparing and giving signals to the body and it's slowing down. If you eat a meal or you eat too much and it's not getting digested, that is not going to feel good. It's going to create, you're going to be upset, your, 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 intestine, like your whole intestinal tract. And so you can, you can actually have discomfort and quite a bit of mm -hmm. it. And now you're treating using medication to get rid of that, and that's just more medicine going into the body. Same with fluids. They, they, people, it's upsetting to think your, your loved one is going to be dehydrated and you're not going to give them an IV fluid. Mm. But the facts are, if you give somebody fluids and their body isn't going to process it the way it normally should and could, mm -hmm. that fluid's going to just lay where it lands which could be around the heart and the sure, lungs, the lungs. Yeah. The, between the skin and the muscle. Like, you know, you can get bloated. You can be, so you can actually hasten symptoms and, and you know, passing and through doing that. And choking, too, is involved. Right, you know? so, you know, yeah. but, but it doesn't feel good, right? It doesn't feel good. It, it feels, as a caregiver, mm. like you're, you're holding back care, that you're taking something away when what you're doing is you're supporting the natural process. It's good to know that. And these this things are always being explained to the family. And is the family involved in hospice? In, Again, and to what extent? You know what? Things have changed, as you know. We, we talked yeah, about, sure. you know, probably how you grew up and some of the things that you saw your parents doing to take care of their loved ones. We don't have three generations living in a three-decker. <laughs> right, taking care That's of each right. baby, the grandparents babysitting the kids, and the kid, and then and then it, the roles reverse, and we take care of the grandparents or the aunts. The single aunt, you know, comes to live, at, sure. with, and all of that. Yeah. There's a lot more, um, you know, families that don't have a lot of support. Maybe they're all alone. Maybe you know their mm. kids have moved out to, you know, whether it's an hour drive or a four-hour flight, or you know, sure. there's not always uh, a lot of support, um, and so. We hope that they can, you know, be involved, but we understand that we don't judge that that's not just how everybody's life went. So um, it's important to figure out who the family is and to honor that. So if someone, we just had someone recently, and I spoke to the person, um, there was like one caretaker, um, and they were being paid privately, so there was a couple, they, she always had around the clock here, and she did have family that were making decisions but they just were out of state. And so the, those two caregivers were part of this woman's life for like 12 plus years. Wow. So we time. treated them and valued them and educated them just as you would a family. We go into a Good nursing home. Good to know. The nursing homes have caretakers there. Um, that's their family for the most part. There are a lot of people in the nursing homes that don't have families. Sure. Maybe they've outlived them all. We've got people in there, you know, we're calling one of their uh, their sons or daughters to sign them on. And we're not thinking, they're 100 years old. Their son and daughter's, you know, 82. <laughs> we can't get out of the house or 80. You know, so you, you have so many different um, situations. Uh, so it's our job to figure out who's the person, right? What's happening in their life? What's happening with the disease? And then what's 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 their circle who are they you know what's our job in supporting them at, through education through social work you know through spiritual care through guidance um and it's it's just really important to so there's a lot of wrap people involved around. our our agency i'm very proud to say and really it goes back to the nonprofit 
um, vision and mission of Notre Dame Healthcare is that we value this, the psychosocial piece as much as we value the clinical yes. piece. We value mm -hmm. our home health aides. Everybody has contact with that patient and they're seeing them for different reasons so they're noticing something different. So a clinician is looking symptom management, um, you know, the disease process, where are we so we can keep the family posted, the patient posted. Our home health aides are giving personal care, showers if they're able to or a bed bath if they're not able to. Mm. Give a gentleman a nice shave so he feels dignified. A, a woman's hair needs to be combed, her sheets need to be clean and crisp, you know, dignity kind of thing. But they're with them for let's say 45 minutes to an hour doing all this care. They may notice something different that the clinician sure. did it because there's a you know, they may see Do they meet? Or, do they they have a do, do all of these people that are involved do they meet at some point? Yes. So it's like doctors get together We're teams, and just, so teams. We okay. try to have our nurse be like your quarterback. That's that's the person that is the case manager who's okay. putting the care plan together. But from there, you have a social worker who's work. You know, okay, what do we need to do again? That mm -hmm. whole like, what do we have going on here? And then, you know, does the family need support? Do we need placement? Is it, is care the caregiver burnt out? What what do we need to get in yeah, place? Yeah. Then you have your home health aide who is going in to give that personal care. We have music and massage therapy full time. Mm -hmm. It's not a volunteer position, it's a real position. They're, and they're licensed therapists. So these people are using great, it for therapy great. purposes yeah, sure. for family and patients. Um, we have chaplaincy, we have, it's in that spirituality, it's all inclusive and it doesn't have to have a name to it. But life, you know, there's there's a lot to do sometimes at the end of life, a lot of reflection. And so we can help guide families and patients through that between social work and the um, spiritual, you know, coordinators. Mm -hmm. We're proud to say we are overstaffed in volunteers. Um, they oh, kind of wow. had to go away during COVID because of the risk. Um, and CMS waived all of those regulations, and CMS is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, they waived that, but in 2024, everybody's gonna have to be back up to their full staffing. Uh, we're proud to say that as of April, we already are, April of 2023. Wow, so we're way good. ahead of the curve, and that is super important. Your volunteers can sit bedside for somebody who doesn't have a family for holding a hand vigil that's wonderful. you know or if it's somebody who just you know wants yeah. to watch their favorite tv program with someone sure you know, we had a lady who loved judge judy and she oh. just wanted you to sit next to her and watch judge judy that's so and so sweet. you know what that's that's wonderful or if it's to play cards or cribbage or maybe it's the family member who wants to take a shower but it occupies you know, the time they can sit there and watch yeah. the cooking show with the loved one and that that person could get a shower in and not be afraid that's so you wonderful. know they, they're so so valuable that's what I mean like everybody's valuable and then you admit people don't give credit sometimes like the intake teams um, we have a person answer the phone there's three rings we don't use voicemail because we want to make sure you receive the message and return it and we know if a nurse is unavailable and if it's a crisis we get someone else on it we don't assume that person's gonna get a voicemail and respond. So we we run a real tight ship that way, you know. Um, we have two Coopy nurses, a director and um, a new Coopy nurse. That's a position, sometimes it's part-time at some agencies, and that's your quality control. Uh, we That's important. You know, it's sure. recognizing you need every single role in order to be successful. And I think, you know, you can have a wonderful, Hospice nurses, hospice aides, social workers, they're in this. I don't care who they work for. They're good people that are in this for a reason. There's a calling, there's a passion, right? But if you have 27 patients and you don't have backup at the office and you don't have and you've got crises everywhere, you can only be so good. Sure. You know, if, if you're not given the tools. Yes, now what about pediatric hospice? I've never heard of that. I. That's because you can't, it's so hard to find. There's probably, I think we're one of three in the whole state. Really? Yeah. I think there's one in Rhode Island. I don't, so it's wow. really, we, we really need to talk. And again, it's scary. People don't want to talk about it. They don't want to admit anything bad's going to happen to children, sure. right? Um, 
just, if we say it out loud, we're not making it happen. So what's happening is happening. And what our job is, is to ease the burden and try to help them to have a life beyond the tragedy that they're in. You know, giving people that support, and, and it's not even in the moment, just in the moment, and this goes for hospice for adults, it's the 13 months after that we follow them. Because you're there for the first anniversary of the what without them, the Christmas, the Easter, or the birth, or the what, you know, what have you. And um, the, the funny thing to that, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago where I was talking to somebody, we actually do more community bereavement than we do our own patients. And I believe truly in my heart of hearts that it's because we do so much work on the front end that it's not as difficult on the other side. There's so many things to think about, and, and you seem to details. take care of all of them. <laughs> things that people haven't even thought about that they're going to need. Well, because is that your job? You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. And I always said this, when I talk to people, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I don't know something. Or, you know, we're sitting at the kitchen table and signing a family on, and they're asking questions, and they apologize for asking. And I, and I always tell them, why would you be an expert in this? How would you not, like... You know, you, did, <laughs> this isn't, you know, if you're, uh, I don't know, you, you, you work as a truck driver for a living. How on earth would you understand the lingo and the, what's sure. going to happen, what you're about to undertake, um, what it could look like, what do you want it to look like, how, you know. Wow. So you really have to listen um, and know people, like hear, hear them. Sure. Now, I hate to bring up money in a subject like this, but That's important. how do you start? Uh, who pays for it? Um, can you give us a general absolutely. background on this? Absolutely. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I know people don't, again, we think healthcare, like I said, the hospice workers are in it for the passion, they're in it for the reason, but sometimes you're still not getting good care. It's not because they're bad people, but you know, how you run an organization, how you are reimbursed, does, it does matter. It's a business, right? Hospitals sure. get paid. You know, it's a business. So we like to think that healthcare means everybody wants to take care of us. Well to the best of their ability. But again, you know, who's paying for it? Um, and is there anybody out there to do it? You know, staffing shortages, you hear about it all the time. And if you're not being reimbursed a lot of money, how do you, how do you have all these people that I'm talking about, right? So Medicare, I would say 90% of our patients are paid through um, Medicare, because most of them are over 65. And even if you have a lot of managed care or Blue Cross and these other mm -hmm. uh, insurances, for the most part, it defaults automatically to Medicare. And that's part of your Social Security benefit. They, they regulate what, is, what you have to do minimally in order to be acceptable as a hospice. You get reimbursed of, of one amount, whether you do 100 things or 10 things, like the minimum that they oh. set out or all this other stuff. So for instance, they don't reimburse music and massage. That's not a reimbursable thing. You know, a lot of these things that we do are not reimbursable. Um, how, do we, how do we get away with that? Well, the nonprofit types of organizations, especially ours, we're, we're local, we're mission-based. We still have Sisters of Notre Dame, Dean and Muir on oh, our board. Do. Yes, That's wonderful. Um, and yeah. they hold our feet to the fire because, you know, <laughs> yeah. if we came back with all kinds of money, they'd say, well, that obviously means you weren't doing enough. You know, you don't have enough people taking care of these folks. So they want to they want to see and know, you know, how you're doing it and if you're doing it right and you're you're playing by the rules and um, our profit margins are nowhere near what a for profit profit margin is. You know, we're um, we're back in the day in the early '70s into the '80s, it, the whole industry was not for profit. You know, and a couple of for profits. It's usually church based, you know, a lot of local community sure. churches, and they'd have little hospice houses, or, you know, it was, it was a new world developing, and um, it, was, it, it was really, and this is the myth fact, a lot of people think it was just for cancer, and, and it kind of was when it was established to, to a large degree. Because that's usually a long term um, type well, of thing. Well, how do we get medicine into the home at that high level and get it administered properly and safely? So yeah. that makes sense why cancer would be, and they have a lot of symptom management. A lot of cancers can, can be difficult to manage. Um, but in truth, we, we've got more dementia patients today as our main hmm. diagnosis coming in. Falls and they're not eating and there's you know lots and lots of things around that. 
Um, so wow. we're reimbursed, like I said, whether it's a complex case in, in a home where there's lots of stuff we've got to figure out and do and a lot of services we have to get in there, or if they're in a long-term care and they've got a great family and, every, and they don't need a lot of, you know, they're just, we're there to kind of wrap our arms around them and make sure everything's going to be okay and, and get them where they need to be. And a lot of the um, times when you've got a home patient or a, no family involved and they're in a nursing home, there's, there's more services that are needed. So it's going to cost more money. So you're going to be reimbursed what you're reimbursed, you know. So you have yeah. to work. It has to be an organization that doesn't have a bottom line that they're really pushing for large profits. So if you have... You know, somebody who's based on volume and profit. I mean, we know how it's it's not a hard jump to figure out you're not going to get. And there are national studies. It's it's coming into light. Like there's actually CMS is going to be putting in a lot of quality controls and oversight because of the fraud in the in. And I'm talking in the industry throughout the country. I'm not talking about right here in Worcester. Or, you know, I'm not pulling out or naming any particular players. Um, but nationally, you know, mm. there are states that. Um, billions, billions of dollars in fraud. So there are a lot of loopholes. Um, and once the for-profits got into the game and started buying up hospices, um, you've got a national company who's buying them up. It's it's not going to be the same as Sisters of Notre Dame yeah. in New York sitting at a board in Worcester on Plantation Street down the hill from, you know, UMass. Are there more for-profits uh, then? Is oh, the, 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 the non-profits are dwindling. There's like it's not quite single digits, but I think it's going to be single digits. We're getting pushed out of the market because if you don't have a strong board, if you don't have strong infrastructure, if you aren't willing, I should say willing, but if, if it doesn't all line up, you know, it's I difficult. I hate to hear that. Yeah. You know? It's completely flip-flopped. It used to be, say, 80-20. Now it's 20-80, you know, um, and oh, it's, boy. well, once, I think once it's any business, once is an opportunity for there to be, you know, sure. money made. Yes, yes. What else do we need to know about hospice and Notre Dame? Tell so, us some more. Um, we have a new palliative care program. And again, yeah, that's the Wild West out there. Um, that's everybody different loves than hospice, that word. They that? love to use it and yeah. they confuse it with hospice. Okay. And, and a lot of physicians will use that word because um, it's easier than hospice. Some people think it means the same, and it, it used to mean the same. Um, what we're seeing now, though, is fragmented health care. So okay. you've got a lot of specialists. I know in the state of Mass, there are more specialists than PCPs. That's, that's a fact. That's data-driven. Yes. There are studies that show yes, I do hear you know, that. we have less PCPs now. So it is harder and harder to have that middleman. If you're seeing a heart specialist and you also have kidney issues, and maybe you're diabetic mm. and you have a podiatrist for the neuropathy. You know, there are a lot of complicated things and, and maybe you have the best physicians in, in the world. You know, you get the Boston physicians, which is great. Or maybe you're using the emergency room as your PCP because you don't have the means yeah. to get to Boston or to get to UMass or, you know, so you're using it's your local. Common. So for a lot of reasons, it's, it can be fragmented at the top just as much as at the bottom. And if you don't know what questions to ask and you don't understand, and let's face it, how, how long are the visits at your doctor's office? It's, how deep it's of short. a dive, it's, right? Yeah, oh my so gosh. So you get it. home and you're like, oh my God, what did he say again? <laughs> you know, what was I supposed to take and not take? What was I supposed to not drink with that pill? Or what was I supposed to, you know? Uh, I write everything down when I go. <laughs> right, I but do. if you don't have it, it you know, yeah, it, it's, and, and I you think have people. To. The, there's a lot of generational differences too. Our senior generation, or our, you know, they respect the, the physicians to the point of like, if he didn't tell me to, then I, you know, I shouldn't. Or if she didn't tell me yeah. to, I shouldn't. And and in yeah. truth, you need to question everything. You need to question and ask the why. So I know you just told me I need to do this, but why? And does that fit my goals? You know, so palliative care gets to go into the home as a consultative, just like another specialty. Again, I'm not batting down the specialties, right? We need them. Yeah. Consultative service. Ours is the only in Central Mass that's a true palliative consultative service because it's, it's nurse practitioner driven. 
It's not okay. tied to a VNA skilled care. We don't have to meet any regulations. They don't have to be homebound. They don't have to, you know, be eligible through certain guidelines. What it is is we have to prove, the burden is on us to prove that that person needed that visit. So we go to the mm -hmm. home and we find out why did your doctor or your rehab or your family member refer you to palliative? What's happening? What's going on? We sit at the kitchen table. And who does that anymore, right? Oh wow. Sit at the kitchen table, because in, in Medicare and insurances pay for that consultative service. And you just, if there's family involved, they can sit at the table because what the daughter thinks versus what the son thinks versus what mom and dad, there's a lot of perception issues. So they can just listen, hear everybody, hear what's happening, hear what's going on, go back and research, you know, look at the medical records, talk to the doctors that are involved, you know, really look at the meds, look at the hospitalizations, the history, what's the behaviors, what's the dynamics, oh, and then come back oh. with a plan, like a care plan that just basically, let's see, what are our goals? Let's put an action plan in place. If this happens, then this. If that happens, then that. And it takes time. Sometimes you yeah. don't have, it might take three, four, meetings to get to that place and or, or, or it may not be that complicated they go once they review the meds make a couple suggestions and it was just a touch base so that's the beauty of of that what happens is now these palliative there are no regulations around it cms has yet to do that they're they're going to, it's going to get there um but we need a safety net for people in between hospital home rehab like you know when you start to have that cycle of, of a lot of things are stacking up and and now we're getting to the point where um, maybe we're, we're spending, you know, 911 is starting to get called, you know. Yes, yes, or, yes. Or, you know, ch caregiver burnout. The kids don't know what to do next and they're, nobody wants to put anybody you know, in, in a long-term care, there's this fear. I've, uh, you know, I promised I wouldn't, what, but, but it's mm. getting to the point where I don't know if it's safe. How do I make it safe? Can it be safe? Is it, you know, there's so oh my much, gosh. right? Wouldn't it be nice to we'll have, have an expert? We'll have her back. <laughs> We've only got three minutes left. Do you yeah. believe this? But what we covered it all. Oh, you sure? Yeah, we covered it all. I think I'm going to ask you a lot of questions yeah. anyway. But isn't it um, complicated? It is complicated. Healthcare is so a complicated world. So the first step world. is what? To call you? Make a phone call. Go on the internet. Um, take a look at the website. So our phone number is 508-852-5505. Like I said, you'll get a person. Okay. Or you'll get an on-call service if it's in the evening on the weekends. All right. And we do have nurses on 24-7. Um, we also have a website, which is www. Notre Dame Healthcare, all one word, okay. dot org. So that's important. It's a dot org. Dot org. And it will tell you uh, everything that we do there. We do have a, a, a campus, so we do have buildings on site that offer different specialties. But like I said, for us at the at home division, we are in 44 towns. We're in your home. We're at the kitchen table or we're in your nursing home. Wow. Um, we try to meet you where you are, both here and physically. And, and guide you and help you. Oh my gosh, you've still got a couple of minutes, so we've got to <laughs> fill that up. But the basic differences between the two, hospice and palliative, uh, give me one, uh, one basic, well, one or two. There are people that it's not an either or, they're not eligible for hospice, but they're having, like I said, these things are okay. stacking up and they're going to the hospital and they're tired of it and they don't know what to do. So serious illness, chronic All illness, right. it may not be end of life. It may be and they're just not gonna go that route. Right? You have a younger person with mm. cancer, they're going to fight it right to the day, right. the end of the day. Sure. That doesn't mean they don't need help with symptom management or with conversations, um, you know, and education around their disease. And it's done in the home and? We can go to where you are. So your home, if it's a nursing home yeah. or a rest home, that's okay. your home. Okay. We'll go there. Sister you living, go. we'll go there. Apartment, house, uh, re we go into group homes. This is wonderful information, and yeah. I hope you're writing all of this down. <laughs> Make that call, though. Get all the information you can. I want to thank you so much for coming, but I know thank there's you. more. The website's really good, though. I would encourage people to peruse the website, um, you know, okay. and, and just take a look. Because I always say, you know, don't assume someone's telling you to use this agency because it's the best. It okay. might just be the easiest for them. Okay, give me the number and the website. 508. 
website, www.notredamehealthcare, all one word, dot org. Thank you so much for coming. Thank we'll have you, you back. You know that. <laughs> and thanks for watching. Bye. See you next time.